And this is Christian Brothers Free Podcast, where we just the innovative, the daring, and the bold, providing informative topic for the black LGBT. And one of the things about the introduction of innovative is something I, I like to stress, mainly because in fact, every now and then we come across someone who's did some amazing things that, quite frankly, those are really get spoken a lot about. But yet, at the same time, we listen to a lot of music today and we hear the influence of this person uh, throughout all the time that we listen to radio and what currently plays on the charts right now. One of the biggest DJs at this time is basically Mr. Frankie Knuckles, who was one of the was well known for his record producing, remixing, as well as also innovative sound, as we now know as house music, which is also regarded himself known as the godfather of house music. And one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of put this on because sometimes we just don't know exactly where all this good music really developed and really truly started from. And that's why I had to bring on Mr. Frederick Dunson, who's also was a friend and also business partner of Mr. Frankie Knuckles. But not only that, but he is also the executive director and president of the Frankie Knuckles Foundation, which we'll definitely go to a little bit further. How you doing, Frederick? Good. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for coming on Brother Speed Podcast. And I, you know, like I said, I wanted to kind of give people a little bit of a history of who Frankie Nichols really is, um, only because a lot of the generations that listen to today's music, they think is maybe created by other people. And it's like, no, 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 this actually goes back a little bit further uh, and actually originally started a lot of these cases with Frankie Knuckles. That's definitely one of the questions I wanted to, um, to pose to you in terms of who is Frankie Knuckles? Frankie, he was a DJ. He was a very creative individual. He is the person that is often credited with developing um, the sound that is now known as house music. I can't say he was the founder of, because there are so many other people who were playing records at the same time he was, who's who was actually still doing the same thing he was doing. So he was born in, uh, in the Bronx, grew up in New York. Him and his childhood friend Larry LeVan both became really, really uh, influential DJs in the 70s and 80s. Okay. Frankie got into DJing because of Larry. And so they both had really stellar careers, if you will, okay. in separate arenas. Larry in New York and then Frankie came to Chicago. Gotcha. Um, he was brought here. He was brought here by Robert Williams who owned the warehouse. And Robert's first choice as the story goes, was Larry, and Larry said he didn't want to come to Chicago, and Frankie decided to come to Chicago, and the rest, as they say, is history. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so once Frankie got here, he brought what he was doing in New York to Chicago, yeah. and mind you, there was something already going on in Chicago, but not to the caliber that he was doing it in New York. What was and, at that time in Chicago? It was more of a bar situation as opposed to an after-hour scenario. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So Robert, Robert uh, brought that ideal of doing an after-hour situation because what was happening here in Chicago was that if you and I went out, we may go to a club and someone of a different culture would be asked for one ID. And you and I would get to the door, we'd be asked for three or four. Oh, wow. And so, oh, oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and, and so out of that came, okay, let's start doing parties. And they started doing parties at people's house. And, and, and out of that came, oh, let's start doing something else. Gotcha. And so they start finding these these really, like, remote spaces and old old loft buildings, old, old factories. And they started doing parties. Wow. So okay. then then Robert decides, oh, he'll go back to New York because he knew Frankie. Him, him and Larry got into a little trouble, and Robert was their counselor, their juvenile counselor. Gotcha, gotcha. And so Robert knew, you know, knew them growing up. He went and asked, like I said, he asked Larry. Larry said no, and then Frankie decided to come to Chicago. So basically right now to kind of, develop a whole new environment for himself. He actually decided to come down to Chicago. And did actually he develop more of his sound in Chicago? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, um, he was playing already. So 
like him and Larry were playing at the Continental Bath. Gotcha. That that was their, and they were playing at uh, different uh, spaces in New York. They were playing for David Mancuso. They were playing for. Um, Oh God, he slapped the shit out of me if he saw me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but at any rate, yeah. Um, <laughs> edit. <laughs> um, edit, right? And, and so, uh, and so they were already playing. And so, like I said, then there, then Larry went and opened uh, the garage, Paradise Garage, at Frankie came to Chicago. And the warehouse was already open, so oh. he just joined on and started playing there. Yeah, the warehouse was already open. Okay, okay. So it wasn't like there was a Paradise Garage and then there was the warehouse. The warehouse was already open. Gotcha. gotcha. And Robert, you know, they were doing parties. In fact, Robert was playing records. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, at that time. Now, yeah. were most of these environments were mostly, was they mostly for African-American gay men at this time? Absolutely. It was it was their answer to the, the situation that I was talking about, where yeah. they were discriminated against at, at the doors of these clubs, like that was in the well, in Chicago, what would now be River North and the near North Side, and and up in Boys Town. Gotcha. Um, and so this was their response to that. Okay. Was that, okay. Let's environment. Let's create an environment and a safe space. What now we would call a safe space for black gay men and black gay women. There were a bunch of women involved as well. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So basically a nice space for African American gay men and women to be able to just have yes. fun and socialize, et cetera. Okay. Now was it yes. around that particular time was it dangerous to do that? It was so underground. I it, it, it was I would definitely say it was risky. I don't I wouldn't say that it was dangerous because there was no um laws governing how you could do that scenario oh okay so okay. right right so what what how robert did it was that they he decided that it would become a membership club and they'd get a charter and then that way people could be allowed to come in now uh, in illinois or in chicago you're supposed to have a ppa license which is a public place of amusement license to allow dancing and okay. then there's a liquor aspect. But since these clubs were juice clubs and after hours clubs, they didn't have to worry about the liquor part of it. They gotcha. just had to worry about the PPA part of it. And sometimes, yes, the police would come in and, and give them a hard time. Mm -hmm. But most times, Robert usually would give them the blues right back and they'd go on their business. <laughs> you know, they, they closed the club a couple of times, yeah. Okay, but, okay. You know, for the most part, he... I, I, I used to watch him when I uh, worked for him. I used to watch the way that he would stand at the police, and I'd be like, wow. Okay. Really? Really? You sure they're not going to card him off? <laughs> and, uh, and and he, he, you know, he'd have a cigarette in his hand, very Betty Davis, and he'd be, <laughs> I mean, he would let them have it. And, and you know, because he, he had his paperwork on the backside, um, and, and they usually be like, oh, oh, oh okay, and then they go on about their business, you know. Okay, okay. So, okay. So I, I don't know if if danger would be the way would be the word I would describe it. I would definitely say it was very risky. Risky, risky. Okay. Risky. But definitely, you know, it sounded like to me he was then leading the way in terms of, you know, getting a space for people in areas that probably a lot of people didn't really quite think about after hours. And I guess where we are now, a lot of the clubs are after hours. So, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it does kind of show something. So during that particular time, he comes to Chicago, and, you know, he's, of course, the, the popularity of the club picked up. Did he, did he start experimenting? I see he also experiment with drum machines and things like that. Is that correct? That came on a little later because it wasn't just like somebody flicked the switch and said, oh, it's a success. No, it took a while because there'd be nights there. There was nobody at the warehouse but the staff. There'd be nights that there was 10 people. There's five people. There's 25. Then all of a sudden, it, it, it was like an explosion. Oh, and wow. it started getting crowded. And, you know, you tell two friends and they tell two friends. Because, again, it was a membership club. Yes. So you had to know somebody to get in. 
at one point, it used to be that you would have to call your guests in and your guests would have to arrive with you, but you'd have to call them in in order for them to get gain admittance to the party. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, it was it, believe me, the, the first time I went in, I was like, well, this is kind of interesting, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and it gave a certain cachet to what they were doing because, yeah. you know, you'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? right. Uh, you know, so it, there was a, a real unique vibe to that whole scenario. Okay, okay, almost like the velvet rope type of uh, of, way of treatment. Am I right? Am I getting right? You can't go past this line until somebody vouches for you. Somebody exactly, gotcha. exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, and there was a gentleman that used to work the door, and I'm like, oh, I remember the first time I met him. I was like, what? What's wrong with that? I mean. You know, he was like, "What do you guys want?" You, you know, um, but but later, as I got to know him, that was just the way he was. Yeah. You, you know, um, so it it added a certain mystique, if you will, to it. Okay. Okay. Um, and it made you feel kind of like. Hmm. I'm all that, okay. Yeah, it's a little okay. special. Tre- it was, it, so yeah. psychologically, it, it kind of got people to think, if you made it through the door, you were it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and so out of that gathering, there were people who were like-minded. You know, there was a certain style of dress. There was, you, you know what I'm saying? It was, it, it was a whole different kind of mindset, and it was more like family, um, than anything else, or it became like family. So, okay. you know, you go every Saturday, you see probably the same people, and you think about, oh, God, next Saturday we're going to do this, and next Saturday we're going to do that, because the club was only open one night a week. Right. Oh, okay, okay. So it really did erupt a lot of close relationships and friends started to develop a lot more with this as well. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay, okay. So now clubs gets popular, Everybody begins to, you know, start, you know, really hearing the sound, and and Frankie is on stage and doing exactly what he needs to do in the booth. So when did he actually start saying, you know what, let me just try to do this with the sound and start experiment with the sound a little bit more. Toward the end of his tenure at the warehouse, he started doing production okay. and started experimenting, um, and. The first record, I think, commercially that he did that was, was Let No Man Put Us Under by First Choice. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And that, that was his very first record. So how now, if I... Commercial. Oh, co- okay, okay. Commercial. Oh, okay. Commercial. All right. All right. So that commercial goes out. How well did it actually re- be... How well did it receive? I think... Uh, unless you knew it was him, you really like, oh, oh okay. Um, I, I think for him, it became the catalyst uh, uh, for him to start thinking about, hmm, okay, this is something else I can get into. In terms and of recording so, recording music of his own? Re- well, production, the production part. Of gotcha, it. okay. And then, you know, then everybody started. So there was like this, this whole... Uh, group of people, a group of, of people in Chicago who decided that they're going to start making music. Gotcha. And so it all started that kind of, uh, let's say, production work for people. Okay, okay, okay. So you started doing in more local uh, talent, started working with local talent first? Yes. Gotcha. Yes, most, most definitely. Um, he got some work. Um, from the east, but it was basically a lot of Chicago talent. Gotcha. Um, the other international kind of stuff didn't come until later after he moved back to New York. Uh, year, you, you know, like five, six years after that. Okay. So once you started working on, sorry, getting the sound going, more local talent, more understanding, there's different aspects of in the music industry, and he could be able to make a, a good. A, a good uh, name for himself. So okay, so he started working with local talent. From that, did he start picking up more people? Start recognizing who his name was and how who his sound was, or has it really quite developed yet? 
Well, th- th- that's exactly how it happened. People would say, oh, okay, have you heard about this club? And then have you heard about... The, the one thing about the warehouse was that the sound system was, was unlike any other. The same guy that did uh, Richard Long, the same guy that did the garage sound system, did the warehouse sound system. Oh, wow. So okay. it, it, was just, it was just a really remarkable sound system. And gotcha. the way that Frankie played with it, or the sound effects, like he was known for running train through the music all night. You'd hear this train, and all of a sudden, it'd get really quiet, and all and there'd be this 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 train, this roaring train, and it would get louder and louder and louder. And you'd be thinking that where is this train at? And it it feels like it's running right by you because the rumbling from the sound. Yeah. Oh wow! Um, that was a good sound system. So, <laughs> oh God. It, it, <laughs> it was one of the best. It, it was crisp. It was clear. It, it, it you know, the, the one thing that um, I would say about Robert and Frankie is that they taught me um, about sound gotcha. and, and what to look for in sound and the, the, the clearness of it, the clarity, the crispness. Um, and, and sometimes people think loud is equivalent to good that's not necessarily the case right right so and you know what you're right about it could be loud and be it could be loud and just be pots and pans and noise true true you're right about it could be really 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 great music that's beautiful and you know you hear all the notes of the instruments and you hear all the different uh, octaves of the singer you, you know what I'm saying yeah, you, you absolutely. just hear everything absolutely. you just hear everything because you don't get that all the time in every club you do not get that that type of sound no. you do not get that type of sound no. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes when I go out and, I, and I'm like oh my god what are they doing and, and it's loud and everybody ah! and I'm like mm, 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 mm. <laughs> you were spoiled with a different type of sound coming up sounds and, like <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. Well, there, there's a whole group of people who kind of probably feel that way. They walk around and you'd be like, oh, okay, time to go. Yeah, this, <laughs> this isn't going anywhere. Yeah. Right. So basically, now uh-huh. he's at the warehouse, but now, towards his, now, when you mentioned towards the end of his tenure at the warehouse, that was around 82. Now you want me to age and, and date myself. So, okay. <laughs> I don't want to date yourself. No, no, no. We don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> um, it's toward the end of 82, 83, I would say. Okay. Um, there were creative differences. Okay. Uh, which is the nice way of putting it. Yes, yes. And Frankie decided to leave and decides to go and open his own thing and Robert goes and does another club and this time Robert um, Ron Hardy is the DJ that Robert decides to work with and Frankie opens the power plant. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Right. And, and at that point once he opened the power plant he really started getting into production. Oh, okay. Um, playing with the with the drum machines, it, it expanded a little bit. Yes, yes. And and so the the power plant is open, and then all of a sudden things changed, and he decided, oh, okay, I'm gonna start traveling because things had kind of dried up for him creatively in Chicago. Really. And so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it 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 became where there was just nothing going on. Okay. You know? So the um, wait the, was the crowd not did not follow Frankie. There were some that followed Frankie. Gotcha. Then there were some that followed Robert. Oh. oh and so, okay. okay. So you had Frankie, and then you had Ron. Gotcha. And so people would like to pit them against each other. And, okay. and I can unequivocally say that that was not the case. You, you know, people have got to make some folklore for something in of order to, 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 to have some sort of rhyme or reason. But that was that's anything further from the truth. They were they you know they appreciated each other. They admired each other. I I, I think people would have liked to see them have like a fist to cuff, but it, that was not the case. 
Okay. People um, just like controversy. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, 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 you know, they, they don't have anything going on in their lives, so you know. Hey, exactly. Create stuff. <laughs> um, and so, uh, at that point, once you, you know things at the power plant started going south, yeah, he just start traveling, and he goes to London. Okay. Which okay. was supposed to have been a short trip, and ended up being. 30 days, being a month, a little over a month. Oh, wow. And then he comes he comes back and says, hmm, there's something to this, this travel thing, you know? Okay, okay. And then, and then decides to move, to relocate back to New York. Huh. And that's when, that's when the notoriety really started. So, um, by him circling back from over, well, wait a minute now, to have the reputation of saying, that you were overseas, that adds to your repertoire. Did that actually kind of make him a little bit more uh, a bigger name because he was overseas now as a, as a DJ? Oh, I, I, I don't. I won't say it made him a a bigger DJ. It just added a feather in his cap. That that was always my my that was my running line with him. You know, I would always say, "Don't do anything that's not going to." put a feather in your cap yeah, and okay. I definitely him traveling and and going abroad opened his eyes that opened situations for him that he probably would have never gotten had he not taken that chance gotcha okay okay that makes a lot of sense that was good advice <laughs> so now he's back well, in it wasn't advice it, it wasn't advice of mine he I, I think in his mind, he just figured, I remember us having that conversation when he said, you know, I think I'm going to move back to New York. And, of course, I was, like, kind of devastated because I'm like, oh, my best friend is leaving. Uh, and, okay. But I also understood that that's what he had to do in order for him to continue to grow as an artist, to grow as an individual. Right, right, right. And, and you were still in Chicago at this time? Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. So when he told you that he was coming to New York, what was what was the plan then? The his plan was that he would reestablish himself back in New York because remember he grew up in New York. So and he constantly went back and forth to New York to buy records, to you know see what was going on in the scene. Now this this is toward the end of Studio Fifty Four as well. Oh. I was going to say, because, okay. you know, around, you know, I'm pretty sure Studio 54 had a lot of influence with a lot of other clubs and venues at this time, didn't it? Sure, sure. So this is at the end of, of right before Studio 54 gets ready to, you, you, you know, go its, to it, its own way. And then so all of a sudden in New York, you had all of these mega clubs popping up. Uh-oh. Okay. okay. And and so of course that catapulted the DJs into a different arena. Ah, okay, okay. So really, it more more put the DJs more as the star of of the venue, or a budding star, if you will, a budding star. Okay. So they they, they were all cultivating their, you know, making names for themselves. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. All right, and so okay. now the mega. So where did he go when he went back to New York? And there any particular club he went to? I can't remember the first club he played for. I, I really can't remember the first club he played for. He then became. Um, he started working with Death Mix Production. Okay. Okay. And and so, um, you know, that's where the work started. The traveling, the production work started. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so when the productions now, of course, while well, in the production side of things at this particular time, did the the names of the stars start to grow a little bit more? Um, I, I think at that point, having your record remixed and produced by certain DJs slash producers helped um, catapult your your record. You, you know, like say for instance, someone who certainly didn't need it, but but would gladly be happy that it was done is like Shaka Khan. Gotcha. And think about all the Shaka Khan remixes, I'm Every Woman, I Know You Love You kind of scenario, 
where she, you know, she already was a star, but here, oh, now this is Shaka doing something else different right. or a different sound for her. Okay. Or, okay. or Alexander O'Neill, for instance. Ah. Uh-huh. Um, what about uh, the Will Downing. <laughs> Yeah, or Will Downing, uh, or Shante Moore. Gotcha. Um, you, you know, these are artists that we we hear the R and B side of them, but we don't hear the house music side of. Them. So it really helped introduce those artists into that genre of music. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, and, and of course, if I look around this time, uh, even when Shaka Khan uh, ain't nobody remix, even in the eighties, eighty nines. She was pr- that it really helped catapult her into the UK charts at that time, like number six, I believe. Well, it, 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 Chris, this is a really strange thing about the United States and house music. Everywhere else in the world, it's like pop music. You hear it in stores, you hear it in restaurants, you hear it on the radio. I mean, it's just you, you know, you walk up and down the street, you hear it. Only here in this country is it treated like the bastard child that the music industry treats it like. And I think the reasoning, because I know you're ready to say, well, why, why, do, you, why do I think that? Yeah. I, I think it's because, think about the audience that listens to house music at that time. So you're talking about 70, 80. Okay. okay? So you're talking about the advent of the AIDS epidemic. So it, it, it appeals to the homosexual community. Oh, okay. That makes sense. That does make sense. I can see that. So, so basically, because that particular, it's almost like the blues was for the working class in the nineteen twenties, basically. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I can see that. So, the mainstream crowd is not going to adopt it, play it on the mainstream radios, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely not, because you know that people would say, "Oh my God, why are you listening to that kind of stuff?" Da 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 da. And and if you think about it, uh, I, I can't say how old you are, but people who are my age, when we would listen to house music, it was a release. So it was a mental yet emotional release because it, it, it spoke to our sensibilities. Gotcha. The music spoke to our sensibilities. So it was something for us to grab a hold to and, and grasp and enjoy as opposed to other things that was going on you know, in terms musically. In your opinion, you know, because now it seems to be to where, you know, music is definitely, is gone a little bit more, like get a little bit bigger, a lot more, uh, a lot more DJs are now behind uh, making music of, like that, but, or either they give it a different label such as EDM, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, the real core of it still started with house music. Am I wrong with that? No. You're absolutely on the money. Okay. You're absolutely on the money. Um, again, it, it was the way that the record company, record companies chose to deal with house music. And, you know, you get a record, let's say, uh, some hip-hop record. Yeah. Because remember now, you got hip-hop beginning to start, you know, planning its roots at the same time. Around the same time, you're right, and, absolutely. And so you got people who are like, uh, who don't listen to that fag music, or, you, you know what I'm saying? Right. In their minds, this is how record companies think. They they don't think that, oh, it, because if I was a record executive, what I would have said is, wow, here are all these people that is really loving this record. Why not let's cater to that? Why not let's market everything to them? They didn't know what they were doing. Gotcha. Um, and, you know, it didn't, it wasn't bringing in the dollars, let's say, a record by Run DNC. And I hate to say Run DNC because now people go say, why are they picking a Run DNC? <laughs> I'll just use them. I'll just use them as an example. I mean, I, you know, they, they the masses would rather go for Run DNC than to go for, um, Yvonne Gage, let's say. Gotcha. You gotcha. Know, who 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 had a really beautiful record. The record was probably really lovely, but the record company didn't know what to do with her and how to market her. So gotcha. guess what? You know, it's kind of funny because around this particular time, I believe both when it came down to hip hop and it sounds like the same thing for house music, 
a lot of record companies didn't know what to do, period, with any of this new sound coming about around the 80s at this time. Am I, am I off by saying that? Because it's clearly they couldn't do yeah. it in-house. And so a lot of these smaller labels began to take, take on the risk. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what, what uh, you know, the mom and pa labels um, who was churning out tunes, who, who knew exactly what this sound was about, and wanted something to happen with it, but by the same token, you wouldn't get in a major label to absorb any of them and say, okay, here, let's just really push this. Gotcha. You know? Gotcha. It's so, unfortunate, even to this day, it's unfortunate, which is now why you have, people can go in their bedroom, literally, or in their dining room and, and start their own record label. Well, and now they're seeing the the because you know, you're right, you're right, you're absolutely right. Because even at that particular time, a lot of the record labels did not know what to do with many of our major artists that we know now until they started developing their own sound. I you know I think I even go back to Ray Charles um, at that particular time. They really didn't know exactly when it comes to putting an artist or either Aretha Franklin, I recently discovered that when it came down to music in general, they put them as everybody else not really re recognizing the, the sound that really they were capable of doing and making much more popular. Sure, sure. Yeah. So so now he's in New York, and now he's on the production now side. He's in New York. And now he's doing a lot of things with a lot of different artists. And so what begins to happen and, around this time? And he's, he's traveling. Oh, he's still uh, traveling. He's still traveling around this time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's where the bulk of his work comes from is travel um uh, you know he's making a name for himself worldwide so he's getting more attention globally than he is locally where you know he spends three weeks out of a month on the road oh, wow. um he'd be booked he'd be booked maybe a year in advance oh wow um, wow okay oh yeah Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a, it, it was definitely a machine, but again, he was not the only one who was doing that. There were other DJs as well. Gotcha. So you had David Morales, you had Tony Tony Humphreys, you had T. Scott, you had uh, Kenny Carpenter, you had Louis Vega. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, So yeah. I, I don't want it to seem like, oh, he was the one and only one. No, gotcha. by no means necessary. Gotcha. There's a whole group of guys that are still traveling to this day. Gotcha, gotcha. So, uh, so now he's traveling, going internationally, making bigger names for himself, bigger name for himself. Now he also started to do some, uh, of course, the production side. He's still starting to uh, uh, gather a name for himself. Also, when it comes to moving towards the '90s, he started to make his own little "Move Your Body" remix uh, by uh, by by Mr. Marshall Jefferson. Is that correct? Uh, him and Marshall collaborated on that piece or, or that period of time. Because gotcha. Marshall, you know, was doing his thing as well and still doing his thing. Gotcha. Um, so uh, you're right, yes. It, 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 you know, the production side was proving to be a little more lucrative with the travel than hanging out and doing a residency at a club, although that happened as well. Gotcha, gotcha. So, you, you, you know, you had all of these things. It, like I said, it was a whale or a machine. You, there was travel, there was the production part, and then there was the residency part. Now, he did, now, so, the, now, did he hit it pretty big with the whistle song? Well, the whistle song was the, one of the first releases from his first album. Okay, okay. Um, and th that was the big hit for him. Or it, I think everybody really sat up and took notice when, you know, you started hearing a whistle song on the Lips and Tea commercial. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, I, I, it, it, you know, it, it's one of those things that kind of, People decided, oh, okay. Well, now I guess house music is acceptable. Yeah. I, 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 I'm saying this in my mind. I, I don't know how he let 
would be if other people probably felt the same way. Yeah. Especially the guy who collaborated with him, if Eric, uh, Eric Couple probably would say, mm -hmm. he would probably say a little differently. He'd probably say, oh, well, that's when people sat up and took notice that the whistle song. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. When well, he started to get a little more commercial recognition. Okay. Commercial recognition. Gotcha. So. Okay. Okay. So, so now around this time, and so where are you? Are you in Chicago still at this time? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now I uh, was I, I was working for county government, so I didn't you, you know have the luxury of, and, and I was in school, so I didn't have the luxury of upping and saying, oh, "Okay, let me move to New York." <laughs> and, and neither did I have the desire to want to move to New York. Oh, you did. You know, oh, you did. I could go. No, nah, I could go visit him and. You know, go for a weekend, go for a week, and come back home. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay, okay. So definitely, did. so you're making a name of yourself during during that time. Was actually working with the government at the time. Of course, he's traveling around this time. But you guys seem like you still kept a tight relationship. Oh God, yes, uh, yes. We we you know we talk every Sunday, regardless of where he was. We talk every Sunday. Sunday night was our night to chat. Okay. Um. Unless he was somewhere that he couldn't get to a phone, some place where he couldn't reach a phone. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that's awesome that, that everything still kept connected around this time. So now he's gaining a lot more recognition. Now he's doing a lot more production. He sees the money. He's doing very well for himself. Uh, you know, when was that that final time where he said, "You know what? This is this is the this is the name of Frankie Knuckles," where his name became big enough where even bigger stars started to come to him. Hmm. I think, let's say the end of the 90s, the beginning of 2000, I think he had decided that he wanted to come back to Chicago. Okay. So the production work was still going on and travel was still going on, but he said, I, I think he made the decision, said, hmm, I think I've had enough of New York. I want to move back to Chicago. Okay. Okay. And so that would have been 2000. Okay, okay. So um, at, at that particular point, he would come back to Chicago and do these gigs for people. And one night um, he played for a friend of ours at this club. And uh, they were really, really homophobic. And they treated people really badly. And he looked at me. He said, you know, the next time I come back here, it's going to be me and you. The only way I'll come back here is that it'll be me and you because I was still, I had started repping him okay. at that point. Okay. Um, and so we formed a production company and then we started doing events twice a year. Okay. okay. Um, and, and it was really strange because people would say, oh, when is Frankie coming back? And I'm like, he lives here. And they're like, really? Well, because he was never at home because he traveled so much. Gotcha. Um, okay. And, and so then we started a production company um, that lasted uh, thirteen some years. Oh wow, that's a long, that's a nice little and, run. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's oh, God, it, it, yeah, yeah. Um, and then at one point, I was like, you know, Frankie, I am just like I'm over this. It, it, it you know, dealing with the club owners and then. People are really fickle. Okay. Um, I, I, it's the same all over the world. And here, there, everywhere. You know, they'll love you for 15 minutes, and then the next 10, they'll be like, okay, I'm over you, bitch. Bye. <laughs> uh, and, they, and they move on to the, well, yeah. yeah, they move on to the next thing. Gotcha. So uh, I was like, you know what? I'd rather just handle you and take care of your other affairs than to have to do this grind of doing this these two events. And, he would always be like, no, 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 we really should do it because people really are into it. And people were into it. They looked forward to it, you know, but it, it was just, for me, God, if he was here, he'd probably, you know, roll his eyes at me and be like, <laughs> what in the hell are you talking about? <laughs> uh, for me, for me, it, it, it just, the fun, it, it, it wasn't fun anymore. Gotcha. And gotcha. I'd rather just do the nuts and bolts and so, it, 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 you know, that's when he started doing the residencies here gotcha. at different clubs. Because that was, you know, it, for me, it was perfect. 
you you know the gigs are booked you go in you pick it up you play you come home and that's it gotcha. as opposed to having to run the whole evening and worry worry about if this is going right or if that is going right 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 <sighs> okay okay so therefore now he's taking a residency he's a little bit more local you guys can be able to uh, he continues to make his name for himself uh, internationally, still doing some traveling back and forth, I assume, around this time, still uh, not as much, though? Um, I would say 2012, 13, he started not to enjoy traveling as much anymore. Gotcha. Okay. Because as glamorous as that may, it may seem to you and I, it's not. Um. um you know, so I, I, here's a day. You, you you know, you get to um, wherever. I, I, I was going to say Las Vegas, but they, they, you know, everybody be like, Vegas. So you get to San Juan, let's say. Okay. You get to San Juan. You got to, you know, you got to be picked up from the hotel. I mean, from the airport. You got to get to the hotel. You got to get settled. Then it's the next day, the day of the gig. You got to go for sound check. You got to get up before he gets ready. You got to make sure that, you, you know, the drivers come and get you. You got to make sure that the club people are all in line. You got to make sure the sound is already like So by the time you get there, you're not there for two hours trying to do sound check. Uh, you know, you come wow. back, take a nap. You go do the gig. You got to leave. You, you, you know, if you're staying the next day, fine. You sleep. If not, you got to get packed and get everybody, you know, together so you can get to the airport to go to the next stop. So it's work. It, it, you know, as much as people like to think that it's glamorous, it's not. It's work. And right. for people who have have to endure it, it's not the prettiest job in the world either. Although there are a lot of people who make it look very pretty. Yeah. Yes. So so basically, right now, travel begins to slow down. Now, of course, around this time, you know, he's he definitely is he more recognized now versus uh, during the time when. You know, Frankie was you know at his at his best, or you know at the time when he was around. Is it getting more recognition? I would say now? that I would say that the recognition it it, it, it continued. Okay. Um, I, it, it still amazes me that even he he's been he's not been with us for four years this year, okay. and. Some of the emails that I get and some of the posts that I see on social media, I mean, it, 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 I still shake my head and go, huh? But it also goes to the staying power of how many years he put into his career. Yes. And all of the hard work he did. And I'm not saying that because I, he's my friend. Yeah. I'm saying that because I watched what this man did. I watched how... He, he really put his all in all and gave up a lot of different things to make his career work, which is why I think it's so important to me and the foundation that his recognition is not tarnished in any way. Oh. Or his, it, that, that the career that he worked so hard is not taken and somebody just, you know... Um, haphazardly say, oh, well, uh, you know, yeah. no, no, yeah. no, 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 this, this man put a lot into it, you know, he, he really did, um, and I think if you talk to anybody who knew him professionally, um, even if it's just on a peripheral, a, a, a peripheral kind of manner, they would say, oh my God, what a nice guy. Wow. Uh, because he made the two things he did, he would treat you with respect if you treated him with respect. But the other thing is, everybody in that room, he would make them feel as if they were special. And that's, I've only met, there's only three other people in the world that I've met like that, and they were all very unique individuals. Wow. You know, they could walk into a room and every, they made you feel like, you know how you have that aunt or uncle who, had, and it's everybody's favorite aunt and uncle because yeah. they make yeah. each person feel special. Yes, That's absolutely. exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, well, so now with the foundation, uh, 
what exactly does his foundation do? Especially if you know, especially you're the probably you're the first person, the best person to speak to in regards to that. What does the foundation do in regards to uh, uh, some of the community efforts? I hear you guys working with a lot of um, a lot of LGBT homeless. Is that correct? Well, that that's one of the first of all, we're five hundred one c three educational and. Um, educational and conservation organization. So there's a conservation component, there's an educational component, and then there's the philanthropic end of it all. Okay. So we have four different um, causes that he advocated. One is, a, uh, is AIDS um, education, research, and awareness. The other one is uh, LGBTQIA, uh, got to get it all in there. Um, <laughs> youth homelessness, because as a as a teenager, he was homeless. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah. And the other thing is uh, diabetes research and foundation and music in schools, which he was a big proponent of. Wow. So, so, okay. so now, because we're in, we're in um, our let's say, infancy, because we're only 90 uh, or 2000, okay. we're actually be four years old in December. Congratulations. We're coming to that point of, oh, oh, yeah, you say that today. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Uh, that, that's an inside joke to me. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> any, anybody that works with non-for-profits, they know exactly what I'm saying. Well, you know, um, you're right. There's a lot of, down here at Wilton Manor, there's a lot of non-for-profit. It is, and uh, one thing for sure, at least in the non-profit, the non-for-profit world, um, to be accountable to those who actually con- who give you funds and make sure those numbers are constantly uh, up, and it's definitely, um, it's, it's work. It's an endeavor. It's, a, it's an endeavor. <laughs> and, but, and then, you know, you, you've got your state government, then you've got, you know, your federal government, so... You know, your, your shit got to be in order. Exactly. For it does. It really does. It, it, it's it, one it of those really things. does. I, I give my hats off to those who are nonprofit because I thought corporate was, you know, <laughs> like corporate America was, you know, one of those like, oh, goodness gracious. But I definitely see with the amount of people that you're accountable to when you receive funds in the nonprofit world, oh, my goodness, it could be, it could be definitely a uh, – Work a lot of work. I can honestly say. Yeah, I, I'll give you an, an example. Recently, I had to, um, I had to do something. I had a business situation, and the the gentleman I had dealt with before, and he said, "Oh, well, this is what I think you should get." And I said, "Okay." So you see me driving up, and you see me in this car, and the first thing you're going to think is. Huh? Oh, that's where our money is going. Oh, he, he, no. You know what I'm saying? Perception is everything. So people people are crazy like that. You know what I mean? Wow. Because they gave you twenty dollars or twenty five dollars. You know that they feel that they can tell you where this needs to go. Or it, it's crazy. People in non for profit that's listening, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. So anyway. Back to um, to the foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that those are some of the causes that we want to advocate in his honor. Um, but by the same token, there's the whole conservation piece. So which means that we want to educate people about how he is. We want to educate people about who he is um, or who he was, who he is, because he's still with us. Yes. Um, so we, we want to tell the story that should be told that people think they know because you know it amazes me that i meet these kids and, and you know they're 30 years old and i went to the warehouse and i look at them and i go you went to what warehouse there's <laughs> that's just somewhere possible you could have went well i was back there mm, okay fine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know okay if you say so you, you, you know what i mean right. so there, there there needs to be the part where we decide to continue to curate the music and the culture and try to move it forward so people 
you know, who are 30 years old can say, oh, okay, this is what it is. And I think that is where house music needs to, the direction it needs to move into. You know, I'm kind of curious when it comes down to a, a, some sort of, like a sort of a documentary that actually uh, shows a progression of music where it is today because uh, DJs are now getting the recognition. I mean, every even in the hip-hop industry, whether you're hip-hop, whether you're house or, or EDM, or, DJs have the power. DJs have the full power now. And, and, and well, do you see a difference? Let me ask that. Here's the thing, Chris. Uh, oh, um, the guys that we're talking about never, never, ever was paid the money that these guys... You know, you hear... Uh, I won't start naming names because, you know, everybody likes their own DJ. Yeah. So you get all these EDM DJs who are getting $100,000 in Vegas. Yeah. That's not unheard of. Whereas Frankie and Larry, if they got... If they got, let's say, a big night for them would have been maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars for New Year's Eve. Yeah. Okay. And that includes travel and hotel and per diem and you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Those yeah. guys, house music, the house music DJs, never, never got the sort of dollars that these EDM guys are getting. But they did more work. The house music, I mean, because it. They actually created music, whereas these guys, they're using a laptop or some sort of uh, prepackaged program to yeah. create music. It's not the same. It's not the same. And it's just amazing to me. I mean, amazing. There was something on Vice TV recently about EDM and how much money, insane money, people are being paid. But really? look at the demographic that they're catering to. True. They have the dollars. True. That is true. That is very true. They have the dollars. And someone in my age demographic is not going to want to spend forty, fifty dollars to go out to a club because, you know, first of all, most of most of the people, I, I don't know about where you are, but at, at least in Chicago, people are feel entitled that they should be comped. And I always figure... I used to say when we would do our event, I would always say, VIPs are the people who pay. Anybody that was comped, I, I don't care how you feel or what's going on with you tonight. That's fine. You got in for free. That's, go buy yourself a drink. Go, go. You know, keep the bartender busy. Um, yeah, I'm serious. You know, you want to complain about something, but you got in for free. Or why well, can't I get in? You know, get me li get you listed for what? What have you done for it? I'd rather the person who has got their money in their hand and eager to come in and support you, those are the people who are really important. Yes. Those are the people that you have to cater to and make sure that they're happy because they're supporting you by bringing you their money. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So when it comes down to uh, people, letting more people get to know more about them, is there any... Uh, documentaries in the works or any other type of uh, movies because you, you know when it comes to putting on a film that that's how people really kind of get the message in terms of who this person really is well there is a featured film being worked on okay um there's a young um african-american um young brother who um his name is julian brief okay. who works with uh he works with Junior would slap me too. He works with um, what's his name from Empire? Um, oh, um, are you not uh, come not on, Smol not uh, uh -huh. Josh Smollett. The producer, the producer, the producer. Okay. Uh, oh, Timbaland. Uh uh. Mm -mm. Um, film, film producer. Oh, film producer. Ooh, Lee, Lee, Lee Daniels. Lee Daniels. Lee, please forgive me. I just had a moment. I forgot your name, baby. I'm that's sorry. That, listen. That's what the power of editing is for. So I can. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I, I am so sorry, Lee. I didn't mean that, baby. My mind, my mind, Lee. You know, you know, I'm getting there. Anyway, um, 
Anyway, Julian is out of L.A., and Julian is working on a feature film called, aptly enough, The Warehouse. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and it talks about, it talks about, oh, I, I can't give you that, because then he'll be like, well, you tell him, the, you know, you give him a synopsis of the movie. Well, but it talks about the early years of Frankie. Gotcha. I'll leave it at that. Okay, okay. Well, that, well, no, that, but that, when you, especially when you have somebody who's uh, worked with uh, Mr. Uh, Lee Daniels, uh, that I definitely expect the work to be very good. Uh, you know, so I, I can honestly say I've actually interviewed somebody, uh, Mr. Lamont Pierre, who've actually worked on Precious with with uh, Mr. Lee Daniels, and his work is beautiful. So I expect some some good oh, yeah. stuff to be coming from that. That's awesome. So that makes it well, a little bit more. Well, easy. Julian, Julian has his own stuff going on in his own right. He's he's got a series or a production deal coming out as well. And ironically, Lee wanted Frankie to work on the soundtrack for Precious and the movie that came out after Precious, but Frankie got sick both times. Oh. I recently, like a year or two ago, I was going through some stuff, and I'm looking, and I'm like, oh, this is a script. And it was a script Lee had sent him for Precious with notes written in it, about, like how the music should sound. Oh, wow. Um, Wow. So, you know, it, it, we as a community, when I say we, I'm talking about black gay men or African-American gay men, yeah. are definitely those with a power definitely recognize house music for what it is. Wow. So there'll be some very interesting things, I'm sure, that will come out of all of these discussions, hopefully. Of course. Um uh, where, you know, the story is told. It, 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 it's funny. I responded to an email the day from an interview I did with this guy from Red Bull, and so he was thanking me for my time. And I was like, oh, no, you don't need to thank me for my time. I'm thanking you for being allowing me to be able to tell the story. Yes. Uh, because so many people don't know, and so many people have their ideas of what the story is. And unless you were there, uh, to me, mine is like, child, please go sit in the back of the bus. I ain't got nothing to talk to you about. Cause <laughs> you, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you, you know? Right, right. right. <laughs> you don't. You, you, you know, uh, so it, it takes um, um, a vehicle like yours to be able to call somebody or to be able to talk to somebody and be able to, for me to say to that story, oh, okay. And so when guys who lived in Chicago or guys who experienced After Hours Club in Philly or D.C. or Detroit, they, they will all be able to say, yep, yep. Now, they may not have experienced the warehouse, but they experienced their own version right. in those cities. Right, right, right. You know, I'm, I am kind of curious about something because I noticed that when it comes to, because house music, of course, now, now let's also make sure there's a division here. House music is not exactly the same as EDM. Okay, is that correct? Oh, God, no. Yeah, okay. EDM is electronic dance music. Yeah, exactly. House music is a very soulful. If I say this, then you may have to edit it out. So you choose. Good. EDM is a bunch of shit. <laughs> it's a bunch of noise. <laughs> it, it's noise. It's oh. noise. House music has a beginning. As every song does, it has a beginning, it has a, minute, a, a middle and an end. But house music... And it inspires you. Gotcha. House music tells you a story. House music makes you feel good. Gotcha. House music leaves a smile on your face. And sometimes house music can be a very religious experience. You know what? Because uh, I, I had a DJ one time. Uh, I, I had a club night down here at Wilton Manors. And um, I had this one particular DJ. He made it very known, very clear that he does house music. And he always described Frankie Knuckles' house music. And now here I am in down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, not knowing exactly the music that Frankie Knuckles did. So I'm thinking, you know, I, you got to explain this to me. He would look at me because he came from Chicago, totally shocked. You don't know what this And I'm like, well... Not really. I, you know, I come down here with Luther Campbell, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm used to, I'm They're coming down to, south. You trying to make you some money. <laughs> trying to make you some dollars. So he, he basically said, uh, you know, which actually got me thinking, you know, maybe I should, you know, look to bring this down a little further because house music, uh, after getting schooled by so many Chicagoans uh, who came down here to uh, the Miami uh, Fort Lauderdale territory, 
they definitely it's a it's a music that they will never give up listening to. So the question that comes wow. to my my mind is the current black gay audience now have they gravitated more towards house music or gravitated away towards house music? You really want to get me in trouble, don't? Well, um, no, I don't like no. I mean, I because I've seen hip hop has taken. Uh, a dip, despite the fact, despite the fact, in some cases, hip hop speaks not the greatest towards the LGBT environment. I think they're getting better now. Absolutely. Which, and not to cut you off, but it dumbfounded me when they started doing hip hop party, hip hop gay parties in New York. I, Frankie would tell me about this stuff, and I'd be like, "How can you go and dance to music that?" about you. I, I just never understood that. Maybe I'm from a different culture. I just, I never understood that. I just, right. But you're right. It's degrading. Uh, but you see all these little uh, wannabe b-boys and yeah. whatever. Uh, I, I'm like, you all get it? Yeah. No, you no. Know, but, but okay. You know, it's you baffling. Have the right it, to live your right. It is. It is. It's one of those surprising things. It is very surprising because if I, you know, as much as I hear and that's why, to me, you know, putting on the podcast to talk about the history of, of music in some cases to where, you know, we got to think about it differently. You know, I, you know, I, like I said, I just recently did a podcast in terms of uh, queer, the queer, queerness within the blues. And, you know, in terms of how that really affected people at that particular time, I think it's very important for people to understand that, you know, music, as far as, first off, black gay people, uh, men and women being Dead, definitely a part of the creation, development, architecting, and also giving it life in a way that a lot of us may have forgotten. And I think we got to really bring that back a little bit or just remind people, give the opportunity to be able to kind of introduce in other ways. I think the other part of it is, is like you said, in blues, in blues um, there are things that went on. Um, there are singers that had their uh, proclivities, and and that was accepted, but it was hush hush. Right. Um. So back to answering your question about um, where do I think the community is now? I, I don't. I, I think that there some of them are lost. I don't think they have a direction. I don't, and I don't really think that they're guides to give them what they need, whereas when, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, there was an older group of people who cultivated the scene. I don't think they have the same thing now. Gotcha. I yep. just don't. Now, th there are going to be plenty of young promoters who probably would take you to pass for that and says, well, I, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Not the same thing. Yeah. Not yeah. the same thing. Yeah. And... You know, everybody has a right to feel their own opinion about it, yep. you know. Uh, but it's the truth because if it was, then the community would be a little different than what it is. Gotcha, gotcha. And so it's more of a general, generational gap, I would yes. say. Gotcha, gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Well, yes. you know, the, the good part about, you know, podcasts like this and also foundations like yours is that, it reminds people, and it's a good way of actually getting people to look towards, looking back a little bit, to, and also, by the way, the current house music sounds beautiful, too. It still is beautiful, so <laughs> it's something that is, uh, you know, being produced. Uh, well, it's, for me, when I go on YouTube, you know, I, you kind of see the, the the number of house records on there. You just simply play it in the background, and it does. You're right. It has a beautiful and inspirational sound, so it's always good sure. to... It's always good to kind of get people to kind of say, just in case, you know, you don't know, well, here's something that you should know. So one thing's for sure. I it's really... a happy music. Exactly. It is happy it's a, music. It's it a happy music. Well, I, I thank you, Mr. Frederick Dunson, for, for coming on the show, uh, because, again, it, it helps people understand a little bit better uh, in terms of the legacy uh, of Mr. Frankie Knuckles, uh, what he did, what his contribution was, and 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 what he and what he's currently his uh, his foundation is currently doing now in his name. So it really helps people to 
to give another look and kind of kind of give a, a, another option of saying, you know, maybe I could be able to contribute towards this because guess what? A lot of people don't take the time out to give towards the homeless, to do all these things. So when it comes to your organization, where can they go to give a donation if they wanted to? Um, they can visit our website, www.thefkfoundation.org. That's www.thefkfoundation.org. And, and there's a donate button. There's different, you know, you get to see who's on the board, what we're about, um, our purpose, and there's a donate button. And I think, I'm almost certain there's an online store, so if you want a t-shirt and you want to, you know, support us by, you know, purchasing merchandise, hey, have at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. What I'll do, I'll definitely make sure that everyone knows um, all the links will be provided under the podcast episode and all the information in regards to Frankie Knuckles Foundation and, of course, the information regarding uh, Mr. Frankie Knuckles himself. So people, uh, for those who don't know, you'll, de- but you'll definitely get to know. Thank you again, Frederick, for coming on the podcast. It, it really helps me. You educated me on a few things, too. So, you know, it's always good to get some new information every time you talk to somebody. Uh, in regards to the history of it and also in regards to the foundation. Thank you so much. No problem, Chris. It was my pleasure. Thank you. All right. This is Chris Dunsby Podcast signing off with Mr. Frederick Dunson. Have a wonderful day. You too.